So here's the highest level depiction of what's going on in the system that we're going to be demoing. You have a user sitting on some data, you have a remote connection, and you have this hardware accelerator. And Dave is the uh, remote user that's sitting on some data right now. Here's an example. A particular type of table is a graph, a set of vertices and edges. Vertices are the dots, edges are the lines. Now let's say you want to query this database object and ask for a property of it, which is called maximum dependent set. Now, if you're not familiar with this particular problem, don't worry. It's just generally what extracts the information. Uh, technically, this is the largest set of these vertices, no two of which are connected by an edge. So there's some mathematical definition for what solution means. So the way that it works, if you're a user and you're using a database, is you enter your database program, you load up your database, which is this table of vertices and edges, and you type something like this, find MIS in test. A SQL is a declarative language, which is very important for us. What that means is you don't have to tell the machine how to solve the problem. All you need to do is tell the machine what you want. Because these things are difficult to program under the hood, that was an absolute necessity for the system. So if you type this particular command, what happens is that locally, the description of the problem, in this case a graph, uh, travels over the remote connection and enters into the hardware accelerator, which is this thing inverted in your quantum computer and some associated stuff. And then the system chews on it for a while, and then uh, if everything works out right, it will send an answer back over the same connection, and the user sees the answer displayed in whatever format they like, either a series of numbers that tell you what the answer is, or graphically, or whatever. It's all up to the user in the application. So the point here is that from the user perspective, everything about the hardware is hidden, and that was done by design. So now, a lot, most of you are here because you want to know what's in that hardware accelerator box. Uh, I am going to go over this at a very high level. You notice that you have cards sitting on your, your uh, chairs. What those are for is for writing questions that we'll collect at the end of this. If you, have a, 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 if you want to talk uh, details, I'm going to be available afterwards for the rest of the day, pretty much. And I, uh, I'll welcome it. So anybody who has a detailed technical question and want to know what's really going on in the hood, the extent of time, I'll try to keep up with the So the fundamental core idea behind this effort that we've got now is that the problem that we send to the hardware has a dual life. It's both a hard math problem or a computer science problem, but it's also a model that physicists use to describe the real world. If you're a computer scientist, the way that this problem is typically looked at is say this problem is in a category which is called NP complete, the decision that is presented. So if you could solve these things efficiently, by the way, I'm not claiming that this machine can, I don't believe it can, but if you could solve these things efficiently, the world would be a very different place. It would look fundamentally different. And in this case, Scott Aronson, who's a, a, a brilliant guy who works at the, uh, in, in Waterloo at the Perimeter Institute, has made the point that it's possible that this is a basic law of physics that you can't solve these problems uh, uh, efficiently. Now, no one knows if that's true, but it's an interesting supposition. The point of this is that if you could attack these problems with a very good, uh, focused effort, you would be able to do things which are significant. This is not your, your dad's computer. This is very, very significant stuff that you could actually make it into the Now, if you're a physicist, the problem, which is the exact same thing, looked at in a different way, is a model for describing real physical systems, and in fact is a pillar of modern physics called the Ising model. This model uh, describes uh, for a physicist the behavior of real stuff, matter. So the core idea, you know, the, the thing that you need to take away with you from this presentation is this, that the way that we have approached this problem is we want to build an actual physical embodiment of a hard math problem. We want to build a thing that via the its natural physical evolution solves a fundamental math problem. So look at it like a math person, look at it like a physicist. It's the same thing under the hood and that's what we're trying to do here. We want to be able to build a machine that is at the ultimate limits of what the laws of physics allow. We want to build a machine that cannot be bested by any machine that obeys the laws of physics. That's the objective. Now, whether or not we've achieved it is a whole other story, but that's certainly the driving vision. 
our approach is a particular approach to building quantum quantum computers, which is not the only one, and it may not even be the best one, but it's certainly the one that allows you to build the most qubits fastest, which has always been our philosophy. Uh, often I'm asked, why is it, what is it about your approach that has allowed you to be standing up here instead of someone else? It's the philosophy behind our design is build the thing as fast, as dirty, as big as you can, as quickly as you can, and then iterate as fast as you can when you design. Have massively high throughput to try to take that big thing you've built, make it better incrementally, instead of starting, which is the other approaches are completely legitimate, they're just different. Instead of starting with very exquisite control over small numbers of bits and trying to grow organically. Our approach is kind of the opposite. Blow the thing up. Provide a million qubits on a chip if you can. And then make the qubits better. Uh, this approach has three advantages, and only one of them has to do with quantum computing. The first one is that, as Colin mentioned, superconducting electronics are extremely natively fast. That means that the natural time scales under which they evolve tend to be one or two orders of magnitude higher than what you'll find normally in semiconductors. The second thing is that these things consume almost no power because of the way they operate. Superconductors don't generate heat when currents flow through them. And that means that you can perform computation that's almost reversible, which allows you to run things at ridiculously low power levels. Thousands or millions of times less power used for calculation than conventional approaches. And the third one, of course, is we, we hope that these things will uh, grow into large scale quantum computers and benefit from scale advantages of doing that. So here's some pictures. This is the, the big picture. That thing over there is a doer, which is, contains the actual uh, business end of this whole thing. It's sitting in a shielded room, which screens out things like cell phones. Although we once received a radio channel on some of our electronics, that was pretty fun. Uh, this is the thing that sticks down inside the viewer. It is what's called a dilution refrigerator, and it's been modified significantly to run our stuff. This thing takes 128 lines from room temperature down to 10 millikelvin, pass it through several custom filter stages to remove noise and temperature. The, uh, this block here, is a big RF filter bank that some of you may have seen pictures of on the internet when it's opened up. This is what's called a copper power filter, and then the lines end up uh, on the chip, which resides at the bottom. If you were to take off that bottom piece and look and see what's inside, this is what you would see. There's 128 pins here. Each of them carries a signal, which you can get with the machine line to the chip, uh, down to the processor, which sits in the middle. The processor is 5 by 5 millimeter die. And when you look at an optical image of the chip, this is what you see. This is a photograph. These things are the qubits, the loops of metal. It's important to note that in this approach, uh, it's, the topology of the qubit is the important thing. The fact that it's a loop is the important thing. 